going to have a conflict with two different mics, and I can't stand still in one place, so uh, I wanted to lob the rear mic. I want to thank all of you for coming this evening. I want to thank the Friends of the Missouri State Archives for having me here in the Missouri State Archives. And I want to thank all of you for coming, and particularly those of you that uh, I worked with over the many years with the Department of Corrections and, and uh, who helped me with a lot of the information that I obtained to do the, the books that I've been involved with. Uh, I'm working on another one right now that's uh, also going to be dealing with the prison, but I've got a ways to go. I, I also apologize to you that came last September uh, for the presentation, and of course uh, I had a little medical issue, and it's kind of ironic because last Friday they wanted to put me in the hospital today again, <laughs> And I said, I'm going to tell you something. They sent all these cards out. I'm just going to take the nitro pills. And I've been doing it. I've been taking the, the nitro patches and using those. And I said, you could just do it the next week. And if I don't make it till then, that's just too bad. <laughs> so we're here tonight. And uh, so I hope everything goes okay because, I, you know, you want to hang around as long as you can. But, uh, you know, whatever the good Lord wants, that's what's going to happen. So I accept that. So we'll see what happens. But it's great to see such a good crowd here, such a nice crowd. Uh, I'm going to discuss with you a little bit about the book in just a few minutes, um, but first I want to put some information together uh, that I've got and, and, and start off with a little poem here, and uh, then I'm going to go into the, a little bit about how the book developed and why I decided to do a book uh, of, this, of this type. Uh, this poem is called Hollow Walls, and it goes like this. Silence falls upon this place where thousands walk, cried, embraced. Near two centuries have now elapsed since these walls were first encamped. I hear the shuffle of their feet. In silence, each is in retreat along these hollow walls. Their sunken cheeks, the vacant stares as each goes by without a care beside these hollow walls. Ten thousand souls have seen this place, have shrieked aloud their souls encased within these hollow walls. Now, as I prepare to leave, their ghosts remain with no reprieve within these hollow walls. Shuffle, shuffle, hear their feet. In silent lockstep they repeat. Chains dangle from their feet as hammers ring the dead man's beat within these walls forever. I've written several poems about the Missouri State Penitentiary and uh, have thought a great deal about it over the years. I really had never had any intention of making a career in corrections. I was certainly interested in law enforcement Tried to get on Missouri Highway Patrol, but I was too short. Now I could get on, except I'm too wide. So that, that makes a difference there. But uh, I actually started as a college student, and I was originally an art major, an art and English major. And uh, so I needed a job. My parents both made a great deal of money being school teachers here in the Jeff City school system. So they said, you know, son, if you want to survive, you better get a job. So. Uh, I went to the Missouri State Penitentiary and they were hiring people and I started as corrections officer in 1968. I was fortunate enough that I had enough college that I also qualified by taking an exam to be a teacher. So I taught in what was then called uh, J and K Hall where the old school was uh, back at that time. So I would teach school as well, but when I taught school I would have to change out of my uniform so that I could teach the classes in the evening, so they really wouldn't let you teach in uniform. And of course, they didn't look at you very, uh, very, uh, what shall I say, uh, respectfully, if they thought that you were going to, going to teach in a uniform, you had to be in uniform. In fact, back in those days, they didn't like education at all. Uh, they didn't even like education. They looked at me with suspicion, coming there as a young person going to college, like, well, what are you coming to work for a place like this for? Why are you coming to work at the Missouri State Penitentiary? And the inmates, of course, for a long time thought maybe I was two different people. So I finally said, no, I'm the same person, same person, probably or whatever, you know. Dumber than a rock uh, back in those particular days. It's kind of ironic because she mentioned this being the 181st anniversary of the legislation for the Missouri State Penitentiary. My wife's third great grandfather, a fellow named James Dunica, D-U-N-N-I-C-A, he actually built the first building of Missouri State Penitentiary after he built the first capital here in Jefferson City. James Duncan was a Virginian. He came here, uh, he was born in 1787. His wife's name was Philadelphia Pendleton Thomas Duncan. 
Uh, her name was Philadelphia because her uncle was Edmund Pendleton, who went to the first Continental Congress with a fellow named George Washington. And she's buried with the church prison farms located in 179. That was my wife's family's plantation at one time. And she's buried up on, the, on a cemetery up there on a bluff. And she died in 1832 after the birth of her 11th child. <coughs> so you can imagine what it was like uh, back in those particular days. Uh, Mr. Delica was a master stonemason. And uh, he built the first prison building out of stone. Uh, and of course, the first state house he built out of brick. And there was some controversy later on that said, well, why didn't you build the, the first state house out of the beautiful stone that you built the first Missouri State Penitentiary building out of? The first warden, of course, was Lewis Bolton. And Lewis Bolton's home still stands out by Wardsville. Uh, and that's the home of Jude Markway. Uh, completely renovated here a few years ago. It's a very lovely home, and it actually predates the penitentiary. Uh, uh, the pr prison opened, of course, in 1836, but the Markway home, the uh, Bolton home, as it was called, uh, Colonel Lewis Bolton home, it actually, they started construction on it in 1833, a year before they started construction on the first prison building in 1834. The reason I decided to uh, actually do this book is I've never found in all the different places that I've, that I've checked with other uh, departments of corrections, other penal systems. Uh, of course, we know that our prison here was the oldest prison west of the Mississippi River when it closed in September the 15th of 2004. So from, the, from St. Louis, Missouri, all the way to the Pacific Ocean West, there isn't another prison older. Old MSP was 100 years old, of course, when Alcatraz actually opened as a prison, although Alcatraz had been a military installation before it was actually a prison. But what I found was, is that I, I thought, well, you know, I want to put something together that's uniquely different. And my purpose is not to show all the negative things about the prison. And we all know that there are a lot of negative things about prisons and jails. Mr. Hughes and I have discussed at some length a lot of things over the years when Mr. Hughes was our deputy director and one of my mentors, one of the people that's responsible for me being up here actually, going back to about the seventh grade when, when uh, I got in trouble with him one time, but I'll go on that story later on. <laughs> but anyway, I thought, you know, it would be interesting because we have a historical gem right here in the city of Jefferson. And as you know from a lot of the newspaper articles and a lot of the information, there was, has been a great deal of concern about any of that prison survival. And we hope that through the efforts of the state of Missouri and through others, including some of the people seated in this room, we hope that the old Missouri State Penitentiary, at least in part, not all of it, but the most significant of buildings will remain intact because it is a living history room is what it is. I can tell you about buildings all night long. I can tell you about people all night long. I can tell you about artifacts all night long. When you can see the artifacts, when you can walk through the buildings, and you can talk to some of the people, that makes all the difference in the world. How long does it take for us to look at a plaque? Not very long. And so that's why the old Missouri State Penitentiary should be saved, because we want to have a better society. It would be wonderful if we didn't have to have prisons. That would be truly wonderful. So what I did when I decided to write Shanks to Shakers, and the book was actually twice as thick as what it turned out to be. And thanks to the Jefferson City Convention and Visitor Bureau, who agreed to publish the book. And we did it through Wallsworth Publishing, which is an excellent company up at Marceline, Missouri. They're wonderful to work with. We were able to get this book put together. And I thought of the title Shanks to Shakers. A shank is a prison made nine. A shaker is what you see on the cover of a book, salt and pepper shaker. And I thought that's about as far as from one end of the spectrum to the other as you can get. And they made salt and pepper shakers there at one time and sold them on the novelty stand. That was legal. Shanks are never legal inside a prison. <laughs> so that's where I got the title. I thought it was something rather catchy. So when we talk about the project object objectives, and any of you that have the book, you will see that I put them in there. I had several objectives. Usually you should have about three. I had four. The first one was, was to, for there to be an awareness of the historical significance of the Missouri State Penitentiary. The second one is to provide a corrections history resource 
And I want everyone in this room, you all are here because you're interested in something, in something to do with the city of Jefferson, in something to do with the state of Missouri, with history in general, and your own personal history. And every one of you has a personal history. And that's one of the things I wanted to bring out, the significance of personal history. It's the personal history of, of the people that work for the Department of Corrections and people that work for the factories that were inside the walls of the Missouri State Penitentiary. If it hadn't been for the prison, quite truthfully, it's very doubtful that the seat of state government would have remained in the city of Jefferson. Because the prison at one time was the industry in the city of Jefferson. The prison at one time had five operating shoe factories behind the wall. The prison had the largest saddle tree factory in the world, the J.S. Sullivan Saddle Tree Factory. My wife's family on her father's side, the church side, that's why they came from Cincinnati, Ohio to the city of Jefferson, because her great-grandfather on her father's side was the foreman of the J.S. Sullivan Saddle Tree Factory at one time. So we had all those things going. And you can walk down East Capitol Avenue, and Steve Viley and I have talked about this a number of times, and you can look at the homes, and you can study about the individuals that built those homes. Many of them were built with the use of prison labor, and a significant number of those homes belonged to the captains of industry of the city of Jefferson, and guess what? They made their fortune behind the walls of Missouri State Penitentiary. That's where they made their fortune. Missouri was the key state that when they passed the Halls-Cooper Act in 1929, Missouri was a state that they used as the poster child as to why prison-made goods should not be sold on the open market and should not be shipped across state lines. And Missouri continued to violate that law well up past the 1930s. And so it's why it made people rich. They had the inmate labor. So my another objective that I had, the third one was to encourage volunteers and corrections. And I can't express to you how important it is when people give their time to help out in prisons. I'm a firm believer in education. I believe that Mark Shriver maybe deserves a life term with no parole. But you know what? He can still improve his mind while he's in prison. And I believe that more and more each year and more and more after my 42 years. I think that that's important and significant. We have to protect the public, but at the same time, we can have certain benefits if people want to take advantage of those benefits. If somebody wants to be an absolute jerk and they want to stay locked up in your cell 23 hours a day because they can't go out in the general population, then fine. That's the way it's going to be. But education, I think, is important. And my fourth objective was to encourage offenders to develop their lawful, underline the word lawful, lawful skills and talents. And I think that's important as well. I'll share with you this little poem called A-Hall MSP. A-Hall is the oldest remaining building at MSP. Construction started around 1865 and the building opened in 1868. That is where someday there should be a prison museum. That is where someday the artifacts that I've collected over 42 years, I will see that they go there. I will see that my photographs and things that I've collected go to the Missouri State Archives as well because I don't want that stuff going on eBay into the four winds. My wife gets so mad at me because she'll say, well, I see you had a little activity on eBay again. And that's my anniversary present, my Christmas present, and my birthday present you know, every year because I've paid, spent a lot of money for a lot of this stuff. And then people have also been kind enough to, to give me a lot of things as well. A Hall MSP. I wrote this December 7th of 2000. A presence I feel as I walk through these halls, looking and touching these massive stone walls, walls that are smooth and cold to the touch, walls of lost history of killings and such. In the dim light of specter, I feel, walking and stalking, oh yes, it is real. But this is a place where dead men are kept, a place where I, as their keeper, once crept, <coughs> turning my head as repentant men wept. So look as you will as you pass through this space, for it is the tomb of our lost human race. Glance in a mirror as through life you race. So the specter I saw won't surprise you someplace as the specter you see may be your own face. Something to think about. So how did I lay out the book Shakes to Shakers? This is what it looks like, and you're more than welcome to come up and look at one after one. I decided that I would uh, lay it out with a brief history 
of the Missouri Department of Corrections, and particularly with the Missouri, uh, Missouri State Penitentiary, since it concentrated on the Missouri State Penitentiary. So I had an actual preface, and then I had a little section called Fortress on the Hill, which goes into the history up until the time that, that we moved out. Then the first section was called Photographs. And they were selected photographs, myself and some others, selected some photographs to put in the book. I uh, want to do another book because after I finished this one, I came into probably 200 photographs that were given to me that I had never, ever seen before. It's unbelievable. And this lady that gave me the photographs, her uh, dad was the chaplain at the Missouri State Penitentiary in the 1920s and the 1930s. And there's some, so I didn't even know some of the buildings existed. So they're quite phenomenal. The photographs go from page 1 to 45. Then the next, uh, actually postcards that I've obtained over the years. And, and of course the penny postcard was very important. And we know that from some of the books that have been done by various people, including Dr. Summers and, and Dr. Parks and several other individuals. But I have quite a number of postcards myself. Uh, some of them are quite rare. A fellow over in Columbia who had over 100,000 postcards on the state of Missouri. Uh, he also lent me uh, some of his, which I was able to copy and put in the book. Postcards cover from page 45 to 58. Then we have staff related items, and those are some items that uh, basically apply to staff that worked in the prison. And, you know, there are, there are probably thousands of items, so this book by no means could ever hope to be inclusive of anything. I have to do with the prison. It's impossible. What I found it was is that in looking at artifacts and in obtaining artifacts, and some of you that I talked to this evening lent me artifacts uh, and, and allowed me to photograph that for the first book uh, somewhere in time that Laura uh, Moeller Adams and myself did, and for this book. I found that interestingly enough, the most difficult artifacts to find were the items that were the most common back in the day when they were using the prison. And a case in point, does anybody remember good old Zeke tobacco smoked in the prison? Gail, how many times have we seen him smoking Zeke tobacco? Or days, chewing days work or whatever. Well, they had a tobacco factory. And what I found was, and you think about all of the thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of packs of that tobacco with the little papers that were, that were consumed in there, you couldn't find it. Well, I had some friends of mine that belonged to the Lions Club. And these friends came up to me when they realized they were and they said, by the way, we happen to have a package of tobacco that we just happened to get a hold of, and we would like for you to have it. And it came from Missouri State Penitentiary. The whole thing is intact, the tobacco's in it, the papers are still there. To me, that is probably the rarest item that I have in the whole collection. Another thing, my friend John Edson, John Edson and I go way, way back to when I was a kid. We're still friends. John Edson's father was Warden Edson back at the time of the 1954 riot. John had some, some of the old aluminum dinnerware. And it came in various sizes. And when I came in, they still used aluminum. They used to sail of that as occasionally like Frisbees. They'd break off the end and make a weapon out of a tray or something. They still use the common bread and butter knife when the when I went, went to work there. But John actually donated to me tin cup, some plates, and things like that. Those are things you don't find them. They were taken for granted. They ended up in surplus property or in some uh, scrap drive someplace or whatever. Those things have become rare. So my point to you is this, and I bring this out in the book. All of you are part of history. When you're cleaning out that drawer, when you're cleaning out that trunk, when you're cleaning out that attic or that basement, and you say, oh, that belonged to Grandpa. He worked at the prison, throw it in the dumpster. <laughs> Don't throw it in the dumpster. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean you're going to get rich. Because I certainly didn't get rich off doing the book or anything else. But what it means is, that is part of our history. A lady came up before we started the evening, And she had a cane. And she said, explain that her grandfather had worked at the prison. And I said, what was the time frame? She told me. I said, I can't tell you definitely that that cane was made there, but I can tell you there's a very high probability based on the collection of canes that I have, or line sticks as they really are, based on the time frame that they were made, how they were made, and they lasted right up through the 1930s. 
because I have photographs of the staff still carrying them 1938, 1939. So there's a good probability that what she has is authentic and did come from the Missouri State Penitentiary. So we have staff-related items, and we have locking and restraint devices, page 71 through 80. We have contraband, dangerous. Dangerous contraband are those items which uh, can be involved in an escape, or those items which have a, a great probability of causing bodily harm and or death. That's called dangerous contraband in correction. Page 81 to 100. And then we have nuisance contraband, page 101 to 117. That's another section. Nuisance contraband are those items which would not cause bodily harm or death, but they're those items that cause a problem in the prison. For example, my friend over there, Pete Addy, who was one of the fire and safety coordinators. Pete can tell you why you don't allow some inmate to have 162 newspapers in his cell. That's nuisance contraband because you can hide things in it and it's a fire hazard. You'll get all kinds of vermin in there and everything else. So that's an example of nuisance contraband. So nuisance contraband then covers page 101 to 117. Then in the back there's prison art. And having taught art at the prison and worked with a fellow named Sammy Nor Samuel Norbert Reese that Mr. Hughes and I discussed at some length over the years, I still have a love for art since I started out as an art major before I switched to criminal justice. And I think there's a real place for, for the arts in prison. Some of these people never realized they had any talent whatsoever. Some of them would never use it again if they went back out on the street. But boy, are some of them fabulously talented. Quite, quite amazing. So page 117 to 134 deals with the art in prison. And then on page 135 to 146, it covers what I call miscellaneous artifacts. Artifacts of interest that I thought were significant enough that they should be included in the book. I brought some things to show you tonight, and I'm going to, to show you some of these things. And, uh, and if you have a question as we get a little further in, feel free to ask a question. If I don't know the answer, the answer to that is, I'm sorry, I don't know. And you know, but I will try to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I wanted to show you first of all, we were talking about the line sticks and some people call them canes. But I want you to notice something significant. These are flexible. And they're flexible for a reason. A line stick was used by high-ranking staff to give direction to offenders. And they were also a device to enforce the rules back in the day when we operated under what was called the Auburn system, which most prisons in this country did, and Missouri operated under for a, over 100 years. And the Auburn system was a very harsh system. It was a system of labor. It was a system, in many instances, in the early days of silence. The early books on the Missouri State Penitentiary, of which I have read a large collection, that's about uh, eight or ten books that were written going back to the first one in, in 1847 by George Thompson, Prison Life and Reflection. It talks about line sticks. These were made later on in the J.S. Sullivan Saddle Tree Factory. A metal rod goes down through here. These are punched out pieces of leather, little rings. This person, you can come up and look at it after a while, had his initials inlaid in an MSP from Missouri State Penitentiary. And they would simply, when they had the old line boss, the old inmate standing there, with maybe 50 or 75 men lined up behind him. Missouri did have the silent system for a number of years. They had the lockstep when everybody moved as one. And the line boss, the officer, and they didn't have uniforms in the early days, the officer did. He would simply point to that old con that was a line boss, he'd go like this, and that inmate knew to move his line from point A to point B. If they wanted the inmates to stand up in the dining room, they would go like this. If they wanted you to sit down, they would go like this. If they wanted you to stop, they went like that. They didn't even have to say anything verbally. So this is one example. I have about 35 of these, and I'm sure there are hundreds of them out there. Here's another one. This fellow had his initials put in it. MVC. And you can see that this is a different type of shape from the shepherd's crook design that I first showed you. Some of them look like Fred Astaire dancing canes. And I, on a lot of the tours, I've had young people say, who was Fred Astaire? So I always have to remind them. We had one young man who came on a tour, and he was a, he was a very bright uh, kid, about 12 years old. 
and we were down at the gas chamber. And he pointed to the, the phone on the wall. He said, what's that? <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness gracious, I thought that was rather modern because it was a, it was a beige color. You know, it wasn't the old black that we grew up with. But we had to tell him, that's a dial telephone, because he was serious. And you know, he didn't want to know what that was. And his mom looked at me kind of funny and said, that's okay, I just forget that I'm 60 something years old, you know. This is another example. Now this one actually belonged to an offender. He wasn't allowed to have it. His name was German Bob, as we called him. And he wasn't allowed to have this. Uh, the thing that differed from, from how things are today, from when I started and back when Mr. Hughes and Nick Monaco and people like that, uh, friends of mine that worked at the prison, is back in the day when Alan Sartain and I and, and, and other people worked over there, uh, Alan's father-in-law was one of my favorite captains, and Alan's here tonight, Captain Casey. And Captain Casey's family was from Taney County, where my family originally came from, on my father's side. And back then, if we got contraband and we got a hold of knives or whatever, they said, get it out of the prison. Get it out of the prison. Some of those weapons were dumped where you could never, would never be allowed to dump them today, I can tell you right now. But now, of course, you turn, everything's turned in if they find anything for it, and they don't find the weapon like they used to because it's much safer. But we've got to remember that the old Missouri State Penitentiary, from 1836 until the Potosi Correctional Center opened in 1989, it was the only real maximum security prison, prison that we had for adult male offenders in the state of Missouri. So whenever that comment was made about the bloodiest 47 acres, well, that's really not 47 acres behind the wall. There's 142 acres of Missouri State Penitentiary property. And inside the wall, there are actually 37 acres inside the wall. But it really was called uh, the bloodiest 47 acres by Time Magazine at one time. And that's simply because if you had people that were troublemakers, you had no place to move them. You had no choice. That was the only place that basically existed that was maximum security. I want to show you these items right here. This little settee made out of bird's eye maple and the table and the four matching chairs. These were made for my wife's great-grandfather. And my wife's great-grandfather was in 1923 shot and killed right across from this building where the vacant lot is uh, next to the old fourth home and uh, to the lot between there and the highway department building. That's where his home stood. He was uh, the foreman of the J.S. Sullivan Saddle Tree Factory. He was very well liked uh, in Jefferson City. He was a rather jovial man. After he left the Saddle Tree Factory, uh, he ran Trich's Cafe down here in Mill Bottom. And on November 27, 1923, Two young men walked in, one, was, one of them was from England. They held his restaurant up, they pointed a gun at him, and he thought it was a joke, and they shot and killed him. And these items had been made for him around 1900. And they were made for him and then given to my wife's Aunt Louise. And each one of these is cut from a single block of wood. There are no nails, no glue, all made from single pieces cut out of a bandsaw inside the saddle tree factory. The saddle tree, by the way, is the wooden frame over which the leather goes to make a saddle. And the J.S. Sullivan Saddle Tree Factory, they made 60,000 saddle trees a year. It was the largest saddle tree factory in the world until they went out of business in 1920. And that was because, of course, Henry Ford's mass-produced automobile. Here's another thing that was made for my wife's uh, father. He died about two years ago at age 98. And uh, it was his grandfather, it was the fellow that was killed. And this used to have some little oars, I suspect, but this was made by inmates in the prison, this little boat. And he said he floated that down Weir's Creek many a time. So Weir's Creek Yacht Club. <laughs> Here's another example of a, a piece of real craftsmanship. This was made for Mr. Trich, uh, John M. Trich, uh, in 1900. And you can see the workmanship on it. And you're welcome to come up later on. But you can see the quality. Here, here you have the anvil, you have the shoe and the nails, and it's just really 
master craftsmanship to make something like that. Then you get into certain <coughs> items like this. This is more of a primitive item, but the fellow uh, would have had this in his cell. I can't tell you how many things that we've thrown away. One thing that you'll see in the book that I, that I love, and we threw hundreds and hundreds of items like that away because we didn't have any place to store them in a, in a safe manner. But at Christmas time, they would make Christmas decorations out of paper. I've seen whole fireplaces made, uh, just beautiful things, complete with the, an, uh, with, the, with the anvils in the fireplace and all the fireplace tools and everything else. Well, one of the things in the book that you'll see in there, I, I, no point in holding it up here, but I have uh, some items that I took over to the Missouri State Museum when I left the prison because I didn't want anything to happen to them. And an inmate that was locked up in his cell 23 hours a day took toilet paper. And he made little hummingbirds and spiders and butterflies and barbed wire and everything all out of the toilet paper. And he made a bouquet of roses out of the toilet paper. Remember, he had no tape, he had no scissors. And he took his Kool-Aid from his new lunch and colored the roses red with it. And I've got that in the book. It's fabulous, the, the, the craftsmanship that some of these individuals have. Here's an example of uh, one of the early cartoons that was done by Sammy Reese. I showed Sammy how to cartoon using pen and ink because we couldn't hardly get any art supplies. That's back when we get them at Bartlett's, and that's before Bartlett's burned later on. And I, I showed Sammy how to cartoon using pen and ink, and I, we could get Indian ink at Bartlett's. And, I, and he would take toilet paper and block these. And I said, at first, what I found the guys doing is I say, now, you're copying an old master, and that's fine if you want to learn a technique, but it really is an art because it's somebody else's work. And so I said, he said, well, what can I draw? What can we do in here? Some of the guys would say, what can we do when, in fact, we're in prison? I said, well, draw from what you know. Take from your own memories. What do you see around you? So Sammy Reese started doing these cartoons. This one says, it's an inmate speaking to an officer. He said, let's get one thing straight, McPherson. I live here, you just work here. <laughs> now, I have a, several of these on my wall because I got called to Warden Swenson's office. Warden Swenson said, Mr. Shriver, he was a very tactful man. He and I became very good friends later on. And Warden Swenson said, Mr. Shriver, he said, uh, you like working here, don't you? Well, that was my first clue that something wasn't quite right. And I said, yes, sir, I do. The same, but yes, I, I like, like being here. He said, well, you know that art class that you're teaching? He said, I hear that you're doing a pretty good job down there. He said, uh, but he said, you know that inmate Sammy Reese? And I said, yes, sir, I certainly do. And he said, you know a little bit, anything about his background? I said, yes, sir, I know a little about his background. And he said, well, those cartoons that Sammy Reese is doing, he said, uh, he said uh, they're pretty good, aren't they? And I said, yes, sir, I think they're very good. And he said, that's the trouble, Mr. Schreiber, they're too damn good. And he said, I'm jerking them off the novelty stand. And so there's about a dozen that he jerked off the novelty stand. This was one. Well, I purchased all of them. I asked Gordon Swenson if I could buy them. And I purchased them and kept them for years. And finally, uh, later on when I went to work for Mr. Lombardi, I got these framed to the uh, uh, vocational, Missouri Vocational Enterprises. So that's something that survived. Sammy Reese even had that. Life Magazine did an article on him. He was quite fabulous. And he would do a lot of other things. And here's some examples. I, I showed him how to do a, a block print, linoleum block print. And uh, I said, you reflect from the things that you know. And here's some of them that he has right here that he's done. You can come up and look at these later on if you want to. But he did a fabulous job. Reflected what he knew about the prison and about life. Uh, and it, it, the things that he did uh, actually tell a story. Here's one of my favorite one right here called Soldiers of Fortune was the title. And Sammy did this in 1971. And you can see the two inmates looking at the other inmate who's a loner, obviously a loner, walking down the long corridor at MSP. And I think any of us that ever worked there know that feeling when you walk down that long corridor and there's nobody else around you. And I can just imagine what's going through these two guys' heads. You know, here's, here's the new fish out here and we're going to take advantage of it every way we can. Uh, this, this makes a real statement, I think, to anybody that's ever, ever worked in the prison or knows anything about a prison. And I've got a couple of others up here as well, and you're welcome to look at those. 
This was called The Revolution and Joe Bingo. And then there's another one here. Same way. So quite talented. Now, a little bit later on, we get into some individuals that, that we've heard about billfolds and belts and all kinds of things like that that were made in prison. Well, folks, there are some people over there that are so fabulous as far as their talent that a billfold and a belt just won't catch it. Here's an example. This is one of the smaller ones that I purchased. A fellow named Gary Reynolds did this. Gary died of leukemia shortly before I retired. But Gary Reynolds did this in leather. And I have one that he did of A-Hall in leather. I have a Missouri State seal that's in that book that I, that I purchased uh, through MVE. It's the only state seal like it in the state of Missouri. He carved it all out of oak. It's quite large. The center section's out of walnut. And it stands completely out of the seal. So the bears of the state seal are all, they're 360 degrees all the way around. It's absolutely fabulous. This one uh, he did, I had to kind of laugh because what it shows is the old corrections officer carrying his baton and he's jingling his keys and the guys are listening. So the old officer is basically in one way telling these guys, okay, fellas, put your cards up because you know gambling's illegal. And so the old inmates in A-Hall, then they're running this little, this little crap game and everything here and, and playing cards. And he's telling them that that's all done out of the leather. So really phenomenal what the guys are capable of. Here's what Gary Reynolds looked like. This is exactly what he looked like. I told one of the fellows that we had in prison that was a fabulous artist. I said, you know what I want to do? I want to have you paint for me through MVE what the artist actually looked like. Because later on, and they can put a face with the work if we ever get a museum. So that's what Gary Reynolds actually looked like. Right there. Of course, he's dead now, so I'm glad that that was done. Here's a familiar face. Gail, I know you'll know this fellow. Our friend Joe. Great artist. Right where he belongs, though. And he's uh, been out, had a thousand chances, and keeps coming back. He must like it there. But a great artist. And that's what how the fellow painted him as well. And then uh, there's some other things up here that are a little bit smaller. This is, these are some of the first works that were actually done. Um, this is, these are the first paintings that were done from inside the New Jefferson City Correctional Center by an inmate, and this is done on board. And I had him put the information on there. And that one shows uh, Algoa and part of the new uh, JCCC looking out of the uh, a, a window up in the uh, engraving section. And then this is the inmate self-portrait that he painted with him looking out of the window, of course, off into the distance. So those are the first official artworks to be done at the new Missouri State Penitentiary Jefferson City Correctional Center when the fellows were transferred. And let's see here. Quickly, I'll show you a couple more things and we want. I know where time gets away from us. Here's a little chair I thought you might be interested in. This chair was made for my wife's aunt. Again, the J.S. Sullivan Saddle Tree Factory. And the seat is horsehair, stuffed with horsehair. And uh, she died at age 89 a few years ago. And I had a photograph of her, which I didn't get out for the night, but I have a photograph of her. With this doll in the chair and her seated next to her. So just imagine how proud she was whenever her, her dad came home with this chair for her doll. You know, and the doll survived all that time. There were no other uh, female relatives to pass it on to, so my wife inherited it. So, kind of interesting. 
Now, I'll show you a couple more things up here. One thing that was difficult to find was the jacket that we used to wear. Ugliest green in the world. <laughs> one time I came home and I spilled some potato water, which is prison made booze on my pants, and it was just like bleach. It just left great big spots. My wife said, I don't know how you're going to get that out. But this is, of course, the Ike jacket. And we had a heavy wool coat, and we had a bus driver type hat. And if you were a regular officer, you had a silver band around it. If you were an officer or lieutenant above, you had a gold band around, around your hat. This, this actual jacket I've got too. A fellow gave me one, and then this one, believe it or not, I got this at the Salvation Army. <laughs> so I was glad to get it, because I didn't have mine. So that is a nice piece, and I do have a hat, and I, I, well, I'm missing the pants. I need the ugly green pants. If the inmates didn't like you, sometimes they would sew the zipper off to one side, because these were made in the fist, they used to do that every now and then, uh, whatever, or you might have legs that were five miles too long for you or whatever. But this, this one's in great shape and it, it'll be great someday to put in the museum to get one. But I wanted you to see that as well. And then over here, I brought a few items that uh, were a little closer to the kind of work that I did when I was the investigator and so on and so forth. Uh, the rope and the hook. These fellows did not make it out, fortunately. You can see how carefully he took the sheet and he measured the distance. It's almost exact between each section of the tape here. And then he put some shoe polish on the, uh, on the sheet, the rope, and he was going to actually hook a brace on the wall. This wouldn't have actually hooked the wall itself. There was a brace in the corner of the wall, which later on they cut off because somebody else tried to go over at that point. And this was, uh, this was something that was actually made by an offender. I mentioned the metal trays. Okay, anything can be a weapon. There's a perfect example of a tray that's been broken off and made into a weapon. So I have a lot of those things in the book and a section on the weapons. And what I wanted to do is just to show the ingenuity that these people actually have. The first one I ever found at MSP was this one. Found it in the ball dugout. It's made from a shop room. Guy asked me one time when I was training some law enforcement officers down in southwest Missouri, down in Nevada, training some officers down there at the jail, the county jail, and they said uh, about how to conceal contraband and how to search. And this officer that just kept talking in the class, and he interrupted everybody, and he always knew more than anybody in the class. Finally, he uh, said, you know, he said, uh, well, uh, why are those numbers on there? And I said, it's very simple. That's so you can measure the depth of the stab wound. And of course, he said, oh, really? And everybody laughed at him, and then he shut up. So, you know, uh, here's a handle off of a portable radio. One of, the, uh, one of the very first weapons I got after this one was, a, was in a book. And you'll see the book uh, inside this book. And uh, I had a fellow by the name of McAdoo. Mr. McAdoo was a very militant inmate. And uh, we were having a lot of trouble back at that time. We were trying to integrate the prison. And uh, every day I saw Gerald carrying this book. Well, Gerald couldn't hardly read and write his own name. I was actually helping him in the English class so he could learn to write and read better. Mr. Rudy was helping him, I was helping him. Uh, uh, Mr. Simmons, Herschel Simmons, was trying to help him in math. And I thought, that's really strange that he's carrying this book every day. So one day I said, let me have that book. I took the book away from him, opened it up, and as you will see in, in this book, it was hollowed out, and inside there he had a knife. Well, the title of the book was Murder in a Hurry. Well, somebody, somebody, and you can see it very plainly along the spine. Somebody, and I always had my suspicion who it was in the class, because the guy just kind of grinned. But I know that this inmate didn't think of that on his own, because he couldn't read Murder in a Hurry. Spoon made into a weapon. Here's another one right here. Here's an interesting piece. This is the binder out of a three-ring notebook that made into a weapon. So you can see that virtually anything can be, can be made into uh, a device used in the wrong manner. Sometimes people feel sorry for inmates and they think, well, you know, that poor guy, he's got a broken arm or he's in a wheelchair. Well, you know, you can't let your guard down because here's a perfect example right here. And Alan Sartain being our training officer over there, Alan can tell you about all the things that he found over the years. Here's a perfect example. A fella had a 
carpal tunnel, had a wrist brace, but look what he did. He took the brace part and he made, that's as sharp as a razor right there. And so that's just an example of what they can do. So you have to be very careful with anything and everything that they obtain. I'll show you one more right here. This one's kind of interesting. You want to get into a little heavier assignment. This is sharp as it can be. Welded. And of course we had every kind of shop imaginable in the prison. You know, these guys are skilled. I mean, in the flood of 1993, the inmates that came from Algoa and some of the other places, from El Hall, they saved, uh, they saved the city of Jefferson thousands of dollars because all they wanted was McDonald's and $7.50 a day when they normally get $7.50 a month. They cleaned up all of North Jefferson City. And some of these guys could run loaders and dump trucks and they had those skills on the street. So these people are the people say, well, how can they do that? Well, they're talented. And just look at the crowd we have here. If you have this many people working in a factory and say there were two of us that were the supervisors, uh, I could hand you this weapon and turn my head for a second and where, where is it? Who's got it? So that's how simple it is because you always had, you always had more offenders uh, around than you did staff. And people, I think, sometimes get the, the uh, misconception that, that staff uh, are looking at the inmates and the inmates are through the bars. Nothing's further from the truth. You come in contact with those people every single day. If you're not willing to do that, you shouldn't be working in prison. I want to uh, wrap this up before I uh, entertain your questions with this little statement that goes like this, and it's from the first book of Somewhere in Time. That somewhere in time we all have been to live and laugh and cry again. We all must live, we all must die somewhere in time. For some time is but an instant slipping by, and for some time is an eternity. But whether long or short, if we laugh or cry, time will come and pass us by. For each of us is somewhere in time. And I'm part of that time, you're part of that time. The men that are incarcerated in the old when they're incarcerated in the old Missouri State Penitentiary are part of that time as well. And yes, uh, they made a lot of poor choices. Uh, but I always think how lucky I was that I made some of the right choices over the years, because I could have been there as well. We just never know. So, does anybody have a question? That's made out of a sheet, and then these are uh, pieces that came out of the furniture factory, metal pieces, and he's taken the old style electrical tape that didn't, uh, didn't actually reflect very much, and he's completely wrapped it with the electrical tape, and then he's put the electrical tape at various uh, major intervals down the, down the sheet. Quite a good job. Uh, quite a good job. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. Um, there, were, there were women from the, uh, the, the first lady to come to Missouri State Penitentiary, her name was Amelia Eddy, and she came there from St. Louis, Missouri. The first male inmate was a fellow named Wilson Edson. She came there for uh, assault on a police officer in St. Louis. Edson came there for theft. Uh, and there were, there were women there. They initially kept them in a section of the warden's residence. Uh, and conditions were not any better for the women, really. Uh, it went on for a period of years until they finally built a cell house for the women, and then later on, the building that faces the federal courthouse, if you've uh, gone on one of the prison tours, you notice that it says female department on the front of that building. That building was built circa uh, about 1904, 1906. Uh, that bust on the front of the building was of Governor Alexander Monroe Dockery, who was the governor at the time, and that was the female department. Uh, that's where Kate Richards O'Hare and Emma Goldman spent their time. And then, of course, the women remained at the Missouri State Penitentiary in that building until uh, about 1927, and a warden by the name of Leslie Rudolph then moved them out of the building over to where the new Department of Natural Resources headquarters is, over that was prison farm number one. And the women stayed there until 1960, when they were then moved up to Tipton. And of course, now we have much nicer, uh, larger facilities. We had Chillicothe initially, and then Vandalia, and places like that for the women. 
But uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, the women worked that prison farm up there, and I remember uh, going over to the uh, uh, Riverside Park, Ellis Porter Park, and you could see the women out there hoeing. They were working in the vegetable gardens and out there hoeing uh, the vegetables. Mm -hmm. They had matrons. They didn't have female warden. Uh, a lot of the research that I found was that they had, um, they would, uh, everybody in the prison years ago it was political. And that included everybody, because I've had people come on the tours and say, why would my great-grandfather in 1933 come all the way from Piedmont, Missouri, to Jefferson City? And I said, I'll tell you why. It's in the middle of the Depression. You had, you know, a, a turnover in administration. And you'll notice in the blue book, you'll see a D or an R by your great-grandfather's name for Republican or Democrat, whoever was in. That's how it worked. And you know the merit system didn't come; it wasn't in, wasn't in then until about 1945 it started coming in. But uh, that's how it worked. So what I found was is that the women, uh, Blanche Barrow, did time over there. Uh, you know Bonnie and Clyde and you know, all that. Uh, yeah, Blanche Barrow. I got a, I got a photograph of her. And uh, the interesting thing about it is is that they talked about how some of the matrons were very kind, some of them were very cruel, and so it just would depend on. That person's personality, just like today. There are some people that don't belong in criminal justice, and some people that belong in it all the way. Anybody else? Yes? I've heard that the first uh, Vietnam veterans were actually sent to the Vietnam War and Vietnam They had a, a group called the AMVETS that started over there. And I don't know if it was the first or not, but I was associated with the prison whenever that, that happened. That was during the administration of, uh, of uh, Warden Warwick, Don Warwick, and Bill Armitrout. Um, there were a couple of people that were involved with that group that, I'm sorry to say, were very dangerous individuals that ended up taking some of our staff hostage later on and ended up in a big standoff. I was the chief investigator for the prosecuting attorney, attorney's office when that happened. I remember it quite well. But yes, there was an AMVET group over there, and it was one of the early ones, but whether it was the first or not, I don't know. Okay? Yes? Could you tell us a little bit about the, the prison riot? Were you there then? Well, there's, there's always the misconception that there was only one riot at the Missouri State Penitentiary. Nothing's further from the truth. The one that everyone remembers, of course, is the one that happened September 22nd, 1954. And I know that uh, I know that Gail was there, and Nick remembers it as well. Uh, I was in the third grade, so uh, but I remember it because I'll tell you an interesting story. The very first friend I made in Jefferson City when, when we came to Springfield, Missouri, my dad was uh, appointed to a, a state job in the Department of Health, and the very first friend I made was a kid named Hugh Dave Wagner, and. Uh, I remember going to Moore High School, the old Moore High School, the new one wasn't built yet, they didn't go there until 57. And Hugh David was standing up on the playground and I saw tears running down his cheeks the day after the riot. And I said, what's wrong, Hugh? And he said, well, they had a riot over at the prison. And he said, and my dad's over there at the prison. And I said, you mean your dad's a convict? And he said, no, my dad's the superintendent of the Missouri Highway Patrol, which was his dad was Colonel Hugh Wagner. So I remember that. Of course, your dad was the, the director back there and everything as well, uh, Mr. Whitecock. So, uh, you know, part of, part of our history. The riot actually started in old E Hall up on the top floor. And uh, uh, Gales told me where his office was down there in the parole, uh, parole office about a couple of things that happened. And I actually had a fellow that came from Nebraska that was writing a book about one of the more infamous inmates over there who pulled the Hastings. Uh, Hastings, Nebraska, bankrupt was quite an infamous inmate. And uh, uh, he was one of the inmates of the other inmates, the ringleaders were actually after. You will see a picture in my book, a photograph that I took inside the prison. And the photograph was taken because we had so much contraband furniture in A-Hall that we decided to have what was called Operation Spring Cleaning. And this was uh, up in about 1991, somewhere around there, 1992. And in my book, you will see a picture there that I took of a fellow named Jackie Lee Noble. Jackie Lee Noble was one of the ringleaders of the 1954 prison riot. He died on the same day as Major Forey in 1999. He died on the same day. Major Forey was a, a legendary uh, corrections officer uh, at the prison. But uh, very, very interesting what happened. Uh, of course, $7 million worth of buildings were burnt down. Um, 
you know, obviously, you always look to find fault with somebody when something like that happens. And what I've told everybody from the research that I've done, I've read all the reports that were written by the commission that investigated the riot, and what they basically found was that there were so many deficiencies at the Missouri State Penitentiary that it was, it was really, really a very dangerous place. But what did Missouri do? Rather than build any other maximum security prison, Missouri went along and continued to operate in the Missouri State Penitentiary. Remember, I was in the third grade when the riot happened, and when was it closed? Well, it didn't close till I was a deputy warden. So that just tells you. So I think it's not an indictment of the corrections officials that tried to make changes. And of course, I knew E.B. Nash when he came there. His son Richard was in uh, feet, feet in my class over at Jeff City High School. So, uh, you know, but those are the kinds of things that occur. Yes, Nick? Do you know or have you done research as to where we housed juveniles before Alagoa? Before Alagoa? Well, of course, there was a reformatory at Boonville. That was already in place and had been for some period of time. They had a, they had a school, uh, they had one at Tipton, and they also, of course, had the, uh, they had the reformatory at Chillicothe as well. But it wasn't uncommon for, very, I remember an inmate named Stevens, who was 16 years old when I was teaching, and he uh, was involved in a homicide in Kansas City, and I remember him being housed at MSB, and he was 16 years old when I was teaching him. Anybody else? Mark? Yes, sir. Do you have a clock that was built by Dallas D. Lane? No, sir. I, I do not. Uh, Dallas doesn't like me very well because I was one of the people that tried to get him moved out of MSP. Because I think Dallas was basically running his clock operation for one purpose, and I always thought that that was so he could escape. So, but I've seen, I've seen his work, and he's a master craftsman, but he was also an extremely dangerous individual. I agree with that. Yes. Yes. Over here. Uh, I mean, you said there in the night, at the 93 inmates helped clean Jefferson City. I've heard stories that inmates on good, you know, on good rapport worked up at the governor's mansion. Is that true? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and here's the thing. When you have, you've got to look at it from this standpoint. The vast majority of offenders come back out into society. And you can talk to anybody that worked for the Department of Corrections, and the Missouri Department of Corrections falls somewhere in the middle as far as its size is concerned. But the vast majority of people come back out into society. Well, it's much better that they learn some skill and that they do something, and pe some people really do change. Some people never change and should never be let out of prison. But some people really do change. And so consequently, it's much better if we could reintegrate them back into society to be useful, productive citizens. And absolutely, uh, I was invited uh, with my wife and I when uh, Governor Carnahan was the governor, and we were invited over there to a dinner, uh, a birthday-type dinner, and we went over there, and the inmates were the ones that, that served us, but they are minimum security inmates. They are not maximum security inmates. The offenders that are out at the Jefferson City Correctional Center uh, none of those people are allowed to come out. So the people that you see working along the highway, which is a job that I'd like to do if I was ever incarcerated, doing picking up trash or mowing, those individuals they come from they come from the minimum security facility. Okay? Anybody else? Yes. Sir. What's going to happen to the penitentiary now? Well, um, there's actually a, a fellow here tonight, Charlie Bukowski, who will probably answer that better than I can, but. Charlie and I are uh, good friends, and uh, when I served on the MSP uh, Redevelopment Commission, uh, some money has been appropriated to, uh, to fix the roofs and to abate the, uh, the problems that exist over there, both the asbestos and the, the mold. And uh, based on what Charlie's told me in the last few days, it's hoped that by, uh, by spring that the tours can be back on schedule and uh, move forward with it. So all the buildings will not be kept there. Uh, and that, nor is that a realistic expectation, but the most historical of buildings, uh, Housing Unit 1, called H Hall, Housing Unit 4, A Hall, Housing Unit 3, B and C Hall, the gas chamber and wall, those type of buildings, they're, they're scheduled to be kept and should be. Okay? One more. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that the prison is haunted? <laughs> Do I think it's haunted? Absolutely. I've never had an experience. I've worked with some of those people. 
and I told them, uh, I told them off camera, if you ask me that question on camera, I will tell you that I have never had that experience. I, I'm not into the paranormal. I said, we that work for Missouri State Penitentiary, every single employee, we have trouble dealing with the abnormal, not the paranormal. <laughs> so that's how I left. Thank you very much.